long ago. Many cultures say a great catastrophe happened. The entire known world was destroyed by a flood, wiping out all known life, except for a few that survived in an ark. But did this event actually happen? Or was it simply a Mesopotamian myth that was plagiarized and added to the Bible? Where we left off in this series was on the location of the Land of Eden, which fit the description of a lost, habitable area that is now beneath the Persian Gulf. However, for many years, it was argued this area gradually became the Gulf over hundreds or thousands of years. As the Ice Age ended, sea levels slowly rose and filled in the Gulf, pushing humans out of the area. Flood legends were then embellished to give us the stories we have today. But in 2014, Dr. Mohamed El Bastawazi published a paper with new evidence suggesting there was a major and sudden deluge that occurred at some point between 13,000 and 8,500 years ago and filled in not just the Persian Gulf, but also the region of what would become ancient Sumer and parts of Arabia. He notes the formation of several wadi canyons, fits the description of a sudden flood instead of a gradual sea level rise. The formation of several wadi canyons and funnel cuts along the entire extent of Tuwake clearly suggests that the breaching of this conspicuous escarpment was sudden and rapid, as the northern outlet of this mega lake was insufficient to discharge the water. The overflow arms have developed extensive alluvial fans on the Arabian coast. The fan of Wadi al Batin covered approximately 60,000 square kilometers in South Iraq, Kuwait, in northeastern parts of Saudi Arabia. The paper highlights the geomorphical structure of overflow channels and how several deep canyons were carved. These were found throughout Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq, meaning the extent of the mega flood would have covered a large regional area. In fact, the overflow channel reaches are several kilometers in width and attain tens of meters in depth. However, the area was not sufficient to drain the water as fast as it filled, and so for a short period of time, a mega lake would have existed in the region. Dr. Bastawazi concludes his paper by noting, therefore, it can be attested that the early Holocene period in Arabia has drastically reshaped the fluvial systems, groundwater, and indeed, the early human civilization. Similarly, before Bastawazi's paper, Geologist Ward Sanford noted the current research of his day that suggested it was a gradual flood was insufficient to account for the geological data in Mesopotamia. He also found evidence in a 1998 paper that between 10,000 and 6,000 years ago, Indian monsoons reached into southern Arabia and created a wet period. Now the monsoons typically lasted for about four weeks which is closer to what Genesis records, that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, whereas the polytheistic versions of the flood say it only rained for 7 days and 7 nights. So the Genesis account more aligns with what we would expect with the monsoon patterns of that region. Thus, we do have evidence that correlates with the biblical account. Long ago, a great flood reshaped the entire region and cut off humans from the Gulf Oasis known later to the Hebrews as the Land of Eden. However, could there have been global flooding? In other words, as the Persian Gulf flooded, could there have been massive floods along coastal regions in a global sense? The idea is not inconceivable. Numerous oral traditions do in fact support this notion. Several cultures from around the world report they experienced a sudden and catastrophic flood in the distant past. One study on Aboriginal oral traditions argues that corroborating evidence indicates Australia experienced catastrophic flooding that affected the coastal regions of the continent. Correlating with the same time as this prehistoric Mesopotamian flood, big changes were happening to Earth's climate. This is known as the Younger Dryas period. About 12,800 years ago, the last ice age came to a sudden and abrupt end, and recent studies 
have suggested evidence of a comet impact, which could have been the likely cause. The sudden melting of ice would have caused sea levels to rise rapidly, and this correlates with 75% of the megafauna disappearing, as well as the end of the Clovis culture in North America. But some researchers have suggested the beginning of the Younger Dryas period was not a sudden and catastrophic change, as previously thought. However, at the end of this period, the Earth's temperature rapidly increased. One study said the Younger Dryas period ended extremely fast, causing a second rapid increase in sea level. 10 million square miles of land were lost, and the global climate transitioned to a warming period. What caused this is still disputed, but this would have caused catastrophic global flooding events. And due to the climate warming, it likely would have caused massive rainstorms around the world. Correlating with the research with regards to the deluge in the Gulf Oasis. So it is likely there were several global flooding events, just never a point where every piece of land was completely underwater. Also correlating with the flood account is the fact that studies into genetics Note that roughly about the same time, a population bottleneck occurred within our species of the people that survived the Younger Dryas period, meaning the amount of humans decreased rapidly before a repopulation event occurred. However, the bottleneck shows more of a sharp decrease in terms of the male population, not the female population, with estimates claiming there was on average one man for every 17 women. Some have suggested this was due to a high rate of polygamy, whereas a more recent study says such a factor could not alone account for the high disparity. And another factor has to be looked at, namely a high level of warfare and violence, which historically has decreased the male population more than the female population. But this correlates with what we read in the early chapters of Genesis, that at the time of the flood, the practice of polygamy began to increase and violence was on the face of the earth. Thus, what was happening at the time period when this regional flood occurred does correlate to what is described in the Bible. And this bottleneck could also explain what we see right after the flood account, which is the table of nations. Some skeptics have scoffed at the idea that Genesis could claim that several nations within the region could trace back to just a few males. But if there was a population bottleneck that greatly reduced the global male population, this would make the claims of the lineages in Genesis more plausible, and that many of the nations of that region that came after this bottleneck could actually go back to just a few males, as Genesis recounts. However, as Paul Copan and Douglas Jacoby note, the table of nations doesn't have to mean all the sons that trace back to Noah are necessarily biological sons. To quote, in ancient times, sonship could refer to several kinds of relationships by blood, adoption, or treaty. The sons of Ham are not necessarily biologically related. Political bonds, linguistic commonalities, and other social connections often constituted sonship in the biblical sense. But either way, the existence of the male bottleneck within our genetics does correlate with the Genesis account that many later and populated nations could trace their lineages back to just a few males. Recently, Dr. Joshua Swamadas published a book arguing from computer simulations and genetic studies that the most recent common ancestor of all people today most likely existed just a few thousand years ago. So the idea many nations of that region could trace their lines back to just a few males is not inconceivable, and this data would correlate with the Genesis record also. Other correlations can be found as well to support this account. John Walton and Tremper Longman note Genesis 6.14 contains the instructions on building the ark, but the verse has several interpretive problems. The word used to describe the type of wood only occurs here and nowhere else in the entire Hebrew Bible. The following phrase, make rooms in the ark, is lacking a Hebrew preposition, and the word for rooms only occurs here as well. And finally, the word for bitumen or pitch is not the Hebrew word for pitch. So the verse seems to be out of place in the Hebrew Bible. However, Longman and Walton 
point out all three of these words seem to be Akkadian loanwords. Specifically, this would mean the second term is probably not referring to rooms, but to reeds. This also seems to fit more with the context, as the verse is addressing the building materials that are needed, not the interior design of the ark. So given the meaning of these words in Akkadian, the verse would actually be saying, make yourself a vessel of stalks from a reed hut. With reeds you will make the vessel, and tar it inside and out with bitumen. This makes more sense with the context and Akkadian cognates. But this also shows more affinity to the location of where the flood actually took place, which was in the region of Sumer, where Akkadian was a dominant language. So it is plausible the biblical authors were citing an ancient oral tradition handed down to them. However, Walton and Longman also note this doesn't actually show they were copying Mesopotamian flood legends as it seems to be its own independent tradition. If we are correct that the biblical account uses three Akkadian loanwords in the description of the materials used to build the ark, that could add reasons to think that the biblical author is aware of the Mesopotamian traditions. Against that claim, however, is that the narrative flow concerning the building materials does not specifically follow any of the Mesopotamian traditions. In other words, Although the biblical description has connections to Akkadian, it also seems to be an independent tradition concerning the narrative flow of the building materials. Thus showing the flood account could be an oral tradition handed down to the Hebrews that goes back to an ancient time in the region of Sumer, instead of it just being a copy of other Mesopotamian flood legends. Some argue that if the flood was just regional, it would not fit the description of the ark coming to rest on Mount Ararat as that would be too far north and too high for the regional flood to reach. Well, this is true, but the text says the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, not specifically the mountain of Ararat. Plus, Ararat might be a mistranslation. The word might actually refer to the Aratu Mountains further south. Edward Lipinski notes based on older pronunciations, the text might actually be referring to the mountains of Uratu, he says, the old pronunciation Urat is attested by the spelling Hurat in Isaiah 37-38, read in the great Isonic manuscript from Qumran. Furthermore, several later works refer to the area where the ark came to rest, to being around Mount Judy, which is in the mountains of Uratu. As Irving Finkel says, Biblical Ararat corresponds to the ancient name Uratu, which was the ancient political and geographical entity due north of the Mesopotamian heartland included in the map of the world. So it is plausible the Ark came to rest in Uratu, and this is also an odd choice to place the Ark. If they were inventing a myth, it would make more sense to pick a mountain significant to Israel, like Sinai or Mount Zion, for theological messaging. Instead, they pick an out-of-place mountain region that has nothing to do with Israel and has no theological significance, supporting the idea they were reporting what historically happened instead of inventing a legend. Walton and Longman say, it is significant to note that if the biblical account were simply adopting a Mesopotamian one, we might expect Genesis to refer to the same mountain. If someone were to suggest that the biblical author was borrowing but changed the mountain to associate the text more specifically with Israel, certainly the mountains of Ararat would make no sense. This therefore stands as an important distinction, because this is not a matter of different interpretations by different cultures. This is a specific detail. Now it is impossible to deny that the biblical flood account does have parallels found in other Mesopotamian flood legends. But Walton and Longman note we cannot just focus on the similarities as there are also numerous differences as well that distinguish the flood account as an independent tradition, instead of it just being a copy of the Mesopotamian legends. Plus, the various Mesopotamian accounts have differences between them as well, and things unique to each account. They are all not just copies of the same legend. So given the external evidence we went over, it is possible all the flood accounts are echoing back to a real historical event that happened instead of just copying an original myth.
as Walton and Longman say. The reader should not jump to the conclusion that the identification of similarities suggests that the biblical author has borrowed information directly from the Mesopotamian accounts. Everyone in the ancient world knows there was a flood, just like everyone today knows there was a holocaust. It is a cultural river. Mesopotamian accounts are drawing out of the cultural river and spinning it according to their cultural ideas and theology. The biblical authors are doing the same. We need not concern ourselves with whether the Israelite authors have access to copies of the Mesopotamian accounts. In other words, the differences stand out as independent traditions handed down and do not necessarily mean the Genesis account is just a copy of the other Mesopotamian flood legends, as it is often assumed that while in exile in Babylon, the Jews just made their own monotheistic version of the flood account by plagiarizing the polytheistic versions. But James Hoffmeyer notes, if this movement towards monotheism occurred during the Babylonian captivity, it seems counterintuitive to take the polytheistic mythic literature of Babylon and place it into the Hebrew monotheistic writings. In other words, it is unlikely for the Jews to have borrowed from polytheistic cultures if they were supposed to be moving away from that idea. The Genesis account is more likely just their own oral traditions handed down to them as well. The ancient world was very sure there was a catastrophic flood and simply drew out of the known cultural history when writing down the accounts of the flood. Similarities that exist tend to be viewed by many scholars, not as literary dependency, but as shared traditions or two literary perspectives on a single actual event. Walton highlights this point with an illustration of the Hittite and Egyptian accounts of the Battle of Kadesh. Since they are reporting about the same event, we would expect there to be similarities, and each religious and cultural perspective will also produce differences. The similarities do not mean one copied the other, but can just equally mean they share the same traditions about something that actually happened in the past. Nahum Sarna agrees, it cannot be claimed that any version of the flood account presently known is the direct source of the biblical narrative, for the latter has points of contact with each version while it also contains items independent of them all. It is obvious that the differences are too great to encourage belief in direct connection between Atrahasis and Genesis, but just as obviously, there is some kind of involvement in the historical traditions generally of the two peoples. Kenneth Kitchen explains that parallel traditions about an ancient event would be a simpler and more satisfying explanation. He then goes on to note the Genesis account is in no way more evolved and is actually a simpler and less mythological account. In terms of length, the flood account of Genesis would equal about 120 lines of the Sumerian or Akkadian versions, whereas the flood account of the Atrahasis was originally at least some 370 lines long. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the flood account is about 200 lines long. So as Kitchen says, Genesis 6-8 was probably the simplest and shortest of all the ancient versions, possibly originating as early as they and was certainly not a secondary elaboration on them. Genesis 1-11 is also simpler and less mythological in other places, like how it attributes the development of culture and cities to humans alone instead of divine creatures, and having a much simpler creation account that didn't involve a cosmic battle or war. As we noted earlier, the Genesis timelines for the Flood also seems more likely over the pagan versions given how long a monsoon would have lasted and what would have needed to have happened for the region to fill up in flood. Alan Miller agrees, if judgment is to be passed as to the priority of one tradition over the other, Genesis inevitably wins. In creation, its account is admired for its simplicity and grandeur, its concept of man accords well with observable facts. Combined with this, Richard Hess notes the names of Genesis 4 and 5 do not show the mark of Iron Age etymology and actually show more relation to the second millennium BC or older. Many of these names have associations with the second millennium BC or earlier, either through the names of Sumerian cities such as Urak and Eridu, or through elements that do not occur later in personal names. Examples of these include Methushael and the first part of Tubalcane, 
which may refer to the Hurrian word for smith. So the early chapters of Genesis that are paired with the flood account seem to reflect associations with the second millennium BC, making it plausible the Genesis flood account came from an earlier time period and not simply crafted late in the Iron Age. On a side note, metalworking and agriculture have been shown to be much older than we thought, so the occupations of Genesis 4 are not necessarily anachronistic. Thus, although this data doesn't prove there was an ark or a man named Noah, the biblical account does seem to align with the external evidence, and the internal evidence does show it is not necessarily just a copy of Mesopotamian flood legends, and could be an oral tradition handed down from an Akkadian source that reflects a real flood in the past that was told by the descendants of the survivors.